This is an episode of Reasonably Sound Classic. For the first 30-some episodes, this podcast was distributed by Infinite Guest, American Public Media's podcast network. Thus, it benefited from blanket broadcast licenses held with every music publisher. After going independent, pretty much all intro, outro, and interstitial music had to be removed. The intro and outro music you're going to hear is an in-progress version of Reasonably Sound's theme, written by Will Stratton. The awkward silences are where act break music used to be, so if you could just imagine like Queen or the Misfits or Kate Bush along the way, that would be great. If you want to support Reasonably Sound in the hopes that maybe one day I'll be able to afford some blanket licenses of my own, you can check out the Patreon at patreon.com forward slash reasonably sound. Okay, on with the show. Like most people, I am bad at planning in advance, except for the big things, you know, vacations, huge deadlines, and even those, man, sometimes I really drop the ball, which ugh, reminds me, hold on one second, I just got to write down a note for a thing that I have to do in August. I'm not trying to suggest that Reasonably Sound isn't a big thing and that I don't take it very seriously, but when episodes come out every other week, which they do, and not every week, it becomes hard to know when to release episodes surrounding what we in the biz call tentpole events. The 4th of July, America's Independence Day, Q. Will Smith. Welcome to Earth is one of those tentpole events. Clearly this episode didn't come out two weeks ago in preparation for the fourth. Clearly it's out now. In preparation for every fourth that has yet to occur, but still definitely late for this fourth. So I guess, you know, you win some, you lose some. But hey, here's to evergreen content. Yes, that's a thing people say. And if you're listening to this in 2016, through whatever year the cataclysmic event that results in the wholesale destruction of all electronic storage media the world over occurs, or if you don't live in America or care one bit about the 4th of July, disregard those last couple thoughts, I guess, especially the Will Smith joke that's not going to age or travel well. This episode of Reasonably Sound is about explosions. We're going to start at an obvious place. Fireworks. And as a convenience store clerk in The Simpsons famously intoned, Celebrate the independence of your nation by blowing up a small part of it. But then we're going to talk briefly towards the end about much, much larger explosions. Now, if you're like me, when it's tentpole event season, which is roughly from about now until the first of the year, January to June is a tentpole dead zone, your internet experience is nearly saturated with scientific explanations for all of the things you are about to behold, or in this case, I guess, have just recently beheld and hopefully still remember. How's your liver doing? Send my regards. Regardless of any specific recollections of fireworks, episodic as it were, we all tend to know a thing or two generally about fireworks, semantically, that is. People gathered together, probably on a shore of some kind, maybe on a rooftop looking up. It's bright and colorful, crowded, probably at least a little sweaty. There's some wooing and at least one friend who complains every year that last year's fireworks were better. Now, in your travels on the great and many internets, it's possible, if not likely, that you've come across some very nice infographics explaining how and why it is that certain fireworks look the way they do. The chemistry of pyrotechnics. How the incineration and oxidization of certain tightly packed chemicals produce a rainbow of visible effects, like stronium red, calcium orangey gold, sodium white, Barium green, copper blue, and aluminum silver. 
The very nice infographic which I've used as a source for the above list, by the way, is one put together by Skunk Bear, NPR's really rad science tumbler maintained by Mr. Adam Cole. It's great. You should check it out. Now, in some text below the infographic, Adam explains that it's not just about setting these chemicals on fire and then getting awesome colors. There are additional compounds added to give sparkle or shine, brightness, etc. Chlorine kicks it up a brightness notch. Gunpowder makes the explosion which incinerates everything, and incineration is the process that creates, as Adam puts it, luminescence. So, but here and now we get to our first two big questions. What is an explosion exactly? And why do they sound the way they do? All right, so an explosion is the release of a great amount of energy in, generally, a short amount of time. This energy release results in expansion, usually of gas. When we think explosion, mostly those are the result of the rapid volumetric expansion of very high temperature gases, usually sparked by some chemical reaction at the center of which is an explosive material. Which is to say, most explosions we think of as being explosions are chemical. I mean, volcanoes erupting, geysers, and that time Uncle Jim blew up at Cousin Janice over her refusal to put a support our troops ribbon on the back of her CRV, those are also explosions. But we're not going to be talking about those. We're going to be talking about the rapid combustion, and in some cases, the even more rapid decomposition of combustible and explosive material which actually outlines our first distinction, that between low and high explosives. High explosives detonate, whereas low explosives combust. Combustion is a rapid burning of explosive material, whereas detonation is a rapid decomposition which occurs at supersonic speeds. That's right, faster than the speed of sound. We're going to talk more about that later. Back to low explosives, i.e. combustibles, e.g. gunpowder, i.e. fireworks. The combustion process which defines these substances happens because of the presence of oxygen in their molecules. When exposed to high temperatures through some kind of ignition process, those molecules rapidly decompose into very high temperature gases. A quick combustion chain reaction causes material near the ignition spot to combust, which produces more heat as it decomposes, which heats the material next to that, which decomposes and produces more heat, which then heats, you get it. The moving border of destruction is called the flame front and describes the process inherent to combustion. Deflagration, the heat transfer of combustible material to adjacent combustible material. Now, as the flame front moves through the densely packed material in a stronium red firework, let's say, that's the incineration that results in the bright color you see. But hey -oh, why does it sound the way it does? Why that boom? There are a couple answers. We're going to go in order of difficulty, starting at easiest. First, the general boom sound happens for the same reason a balloon or a tire make a pop sound. It's just that an explosive, like fireworks, move so much more air, they kind of graduate. The boom is sort of like a pop with a diploma. Purposeful sounds made by explosives are called reports. A firework, for instance, has a report. So when all that densely packed material is rapidly combusting, rapidly expanding, and creating all of that hot gas in the process, it generates tons of pressure, which dissipates. When a firework, for instance, explodes, there is so much energy being created that all the air surrounding it is being pushed out of the way. And as we've talked about in the past, sound is not but displaced waves of air. It may be easier, though not completely accurate, to think of it like throwing pebbles into a lake. 
The pebble hitting the water is the explosion, and the ripples signify the report. Waves of disrupted air emanating from the center of the explosion. Except when it's explosions or a fireworks show, instead of one plane, like on the surface of the lake, it's all planes and the waves interact with one another and also there's this couple next to you and they're not watching the fireworks but they're fighting about which tyler the creator record is best and it, uh, yeah I, I mean this is why people go to lakes to relax and not fireworks shows So now, the two more complicated aspects of the sound that fireworks make. Beyond the fact that the substances in fireworks go boom when packed tightly and incinerated, there are also container shapes and substances which influence the sound of those explosions in the sky, not the band, the celebratory pyrotechnics. You might, for instance, have seen the type of firework that sparkles and makes that crackling noise. Those are called dragon's eggs, and actually, there's a bit of an interesting story about them. They were originally made with a chemical called lead tetraoxide, which is also used in batteries, lead glass, and rust-proof paint. In other words, terrifying things that we all understand to be less than safe. Lead tetra oxide did the crackling, but also gave everyone the giblies, throwing it into the air and incinerating it. So dragon's eggs actually fell out of favor until semi-recently, when other less terrifying compounds were found to have similar sparkly crackling effects, specifically bismuth trioxide or bismuth subcarbonate. The one big question this dragon egg story leads me to, which I haven't been able to find an answer to, which makes me think the answer is no, is whether or not the different mixes of substances resulting in the different colors of fireworks also affect their sound when they explode. Meaning, is there a way in which the explosion of a barium green firework is different at the source than a copper blue one? At this most recent fireworks display that I went to, I tried to tune as close as possible into the sound of each firework and keep track of their colors, but it was tough for all of the reasons that you'd assume trying to tune into the minutia of a distant firework report might be on a night of revelry. Anyway, it might not matter because in many fireworks, they have what are called sound charges, extra bits of combustible material which may or may not contribute a visible element, like a white flash or a small burst of flame, but which is mostly present to either go boom or pop. That's right. Your firework sounds are juiced. A little extra gunpowder, some perchlorate, which is also, as it turns out, wicked bad for you, flash powder, and who knows what else, because to be perfectly honest, there is a surprising lack of information about what all goes into fireworks on the internet, and all of my normal research sources came up empty. Which actually brings us to a fun, sort of long digression. When I was a kid, I got really into up-close magic specifically card tricks. I thought that kind of thing was super cool, really wanted to be the kind of person who always had a deck of cards on them and could do neat things with the deck of cards, and I don't know, impress people at parties, I don't know, come on, it's, it was the 90s, give me a break, anyway. It being the 90s and me being who I am, I thought, okay, great, I will get my start looking for stuff on the internet, and I found nothing. The internet taught me no shortage of good and bad lessons during my formative years, but it taught me nearly zilch about card magic. So I went to my local magician's supply store on the waterfront of Boston. The guys there were really nice, recommended cards for my hand shape and size, gave me some tips, and of course, sold me some books. Now, when I say books, I use the term rather lightly infinitely Xeroxed ancient paper husks is really more accurate. These books had more in common with the punk zines that my friends were printing in their basements than anything I would ever have expected to learn a skill from. And I learned over the next year or two that this was where close card magic knowledge came from. It came from dudes in shops and from cheap but hard to find physical sources, because in a weird way, it has to 
What is magic if not something which common sets of knowledge cannot explain? So I have a feeling that much of pyrotechnics is similar. That for all of the light the fruits of its labors ends up emitting, it's still something of a dark art. What exactly goes into a sound charge? I'm, I'm not sure. How exactly are things packed? Uh, you can tell kind of generally, but not specifically, or at least I can't find it. What precisely is the ignition process in a professional fireworks show? I have no clue. I might could gain a clue if I were to track down the guys or the manuals. I found a couple actually, or rather traces of them, these manuals. They remind me deeply of those old magic manuals. Infinitely Xeroxed, 35 pages of exactly one thing that you need to know. But of course, none of them have been scanned and put on the internet. Maybe that's okay. I mean, I'm sure the other part of the equation is that in pyrotechnics, unlike card magic, you could lose a hand. So finally, before we move on to bigger batter booms, the last and final insight I have into the sound of fireworks. It's about the whistler, those fireworks which whistle as they go up into the sky. Lots of people, myself included, assume that the whistle is made by the shells and that it's purely mechanical. Meaning there is something about the casing into which the explosives are packed, which causes a whistling sound as it travels through the air. Like if you were to superglue a ref's whistle onto the hood of your car. Which I've done. Highly recommended. It stops whistling when you go really fast, like if you're on the highway, but speeding up and slowing down at stoplights, it is great. Anyway, whistlers, it's not mechanical. That's not how whistlers work. The sound is also, apparently, chemically produced. According to EpicFireworks.com, when potassium benzoate burns with other chemicals in the fireworks, it goes woo-woo, as whistles do. So we're going to wrap this all up by returning to the thing I said we would. High explosives. Supersonic detonation. Fireworks explode in a way that looks nice. They're destructive, don't get me wrong. Fireworks are illegal in many states for lots of very good reasons. Pretty as they are, they are still explosions. Still dangerous. High explosives are just destructive. We could, if we wanted to, discuss the aesthetic properties of the destruction visited upon the world through the use of high explosives, but I don't think we need to, and more importantly, I don't want to. Lest such a non-nuanced discussion accidentally morphs into some kind of apology or justification for their use against humans. So, when we say high explosives, we mean things like TNT, C4, the next thing which I am about to not pronounce correctly, Penta erythritol tetranitrate, otherwise known as PETN. It's also probably worth mentioning high explosives and nuclear material are different classes of explosives. Nuclear material in a class all its own, one which we're not going to talk about. So where low explosives combust, high explosives detonate, which is a kind of supersonic combustion. Remember the flame front of low explosives? In high explosives, that's replaced with a shock front. The specifics of detonation, how it works, how it happens to the substances in which it occurs, it's a bit beyond the scope of this episode, reasonably sound in general, and my knowledge of chemistry, which was the only class besides gym that I ever got a C in during high school. So I hope it suffices to say that the process is the same as that with low explosives, but also very different and importantly, much faster. Much, much faster. That speed is what creates the shock wave or blast wave and its related sonic disturbance, the sonic boom. Sonic boom! I'm sorry, I felt like I had to. In order to understand why shock waves and sonic booms occur, let's go back to our significantly less than accurate pebble thrown into the lake metaphor. So you throw the pebble, it hits the surface of the water and it makes waves just like normal, except there's something special about this pebble. It displaces the water it hits at the surface of the lake much faster 
than other pebbles. So fast, in fact. It does so faster than the water is capable of transmitting and dissipating the waves. And so the waves build up upon one another. They run into one another. The analogy I've frequently seen is like a traffic jam. They pile up before finally being dissipated in one massive go. A shockwave and the resulting sonic boom is that, but with air and sound, respectively. The displacement of whatever the dispersive media is with such speed that it literally cannot get out of the way fast enough, and so it all runs together. That's why supersonic jets create sonic booms. The physics of flight requires that aircraft create pressure waves in order to stay aloft, and when a jet is moving faster than the sound barrier, those pressure waves build up upon one another. From the ground, you see a jet zip by up in the sky, and then there's this thud or thump, which can sometimes sound a lot like an explosion that follows it. That's the sound of all of those pressure waves building up on one another. Compared to a normal jet flying overhead, where you just hear a steady hum, that's mostly aerodynamic noise as well, unless it's flying really close overhead and you can hear the engines, but it doesn't result in a sonic boom because those pressure waves don't collide. High explosives create sonic booms, though they are the result of what are called blast or shock waves, where a supersonic jet creates its sonic boom via the piling up of pressure waves necessary for flight, high explosives detonate so quickly that a blast wave is generated through the extreme and rapid release of energy generated by the explosion. A blast wave is a kind of subwave of shock waves, which describe any faster than sound wave-like disturbance. Only high explosives generate blast waves and they are very dangerous. An explosion might, with its force, level whatever is in the immediate vicinity. It might cause material to light on fire, but the contact or shock front of a blast wave resulting from high explosives can destroy all the things surrounding it just by sheer force. By the fact that it's followed by a blast wind which can pull fire or debris with it or by the fact that as it dissipates, a low pressure area is created which can pull material towards the center of the explosion. An area which is not good to be in. In comparison to the sonic booms made by aircraft, the sonic component of shock waves made by high explosives and blast fronts are more of a loud crack, almost like lightning if you've ever managed to hear real lightning. And if you haven't, that's fine. I don't recommend it. Unless you're at the Science Museum, I guess. The crack reflects the speed, intensity, and temperature of the process which is occurring, and far from being exciting, it sounds... ominous. Which is a strange word to use in conjunction with a sort of cracking, snapping noise, but it's about all I can get to. And actually, as a parting thought, it makes me wonder, if there's an upper bound to the revelrous effectiveness of the juiced aftermarket sounds built into our fireworks, is there a point at which the sounds of those pyrotechnics cross the border from the dull thud and booms we know and love to something more innately portentous? Is part of the joy of fireworks that while they are explosions in the sky, they do not really sound like explosions. They're able to sonically reference the excitement we want without the terror that we don't. This also makes me wonder, do combat veterans go to fireworks celebrations? I don't know. My name is Mike Rugnetta. And this podcast has been Reasonably Sound. You can find Reasonably Sound on Twitter and Instagram at Reasonably S N D. And you can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Tumblr at Mike Rugnetta. <laughs>